You're listening to Dodge Movie Podcast. Your hosts are Christy and Mike Dodge, the founders of Dodge Media Productions. We produce films and podcasts, so this is a podcast about films. Join them as they share their passion for filmmaking. Welcome back, everyone, to Dodge Movie Podcast. Today, we are going to talk about La La Land in our month of musicals. Just a quick reminder, we have about five days left of this month for you to submit your review to be considered to be added to the drawing to win one month free streaming service of your choice. So just go to your favorite podcast app and submit that review and we will, in five days, put them all into a hat, pull it out, and you will win a free month on us as a thank you. So get that in. Let's see. So today we're talking about the 2016 movie directed by Damien Chazelle, starring Ryan Gosling, Emma Stone, J.K. Simmons, and Rosemary DeWitt, to name a few. The synopsis for the film is while navigating their careers in Los Angeles, a pianist and an actress fall in love while attempting to reconcile their aspirations for the future. The tagline is, here's to the fools who dream. Mike, what was the pickup line for this film? Pickup line was sung, and it was, I think about that day. That kicks off this amazing scene that seems like, you know, a production director's nightmare to orchestrate. It Mm -hmm. takes place on an L.A. overpass. I don't think this overpass is normally shut down. I think it was just shut down for production. So that would have been nightmarish. Yes. I could have swore that I saw in some of the making of as they were promoting it, that they got lucky because it was an overpass that was already shut down due to construction. And it was set to open in a few days. And so they hit this perfect window of it's safe enough to have people on and (laughs) cars, but not quite ready to be opened. So I think it was kind of a coup on that level. Another fun fact from that that I read on the internets is that the choreographer was on her belly wedged under one of the cars so she wouldn't be in the shot but could still call out direction. That's commitment. And I was just doing a little bit of homework before we started recording and I read that it only has 30 dancers and all of the other people that we see in the cars are CGI. Wow, that's a lot of CGI. I know, because when they pull back, it looks like the whole thing is just everyone dancing. So Eh, Good work to the visual effects guys then. Yeah, it is an amazing number. It's very colorful. We noted, I think it was at the beginning, the cars are extremely colorful. And then there's like a midpoint to the song and all the cars were like grays and whites and blacks. But then it kind of went back to where it was... I guess mixed kind of because we were trying to see is are they trying to tell us something and I don't know if that was purposeful or they just didn't mix them up but it was noticed by these two viewers I'll say that. I did notice that a lot of the vehicles the colorful vehicles at the beginning were older like Sebastian's Buick Riviera I think that was an 83 or something I noticed that there were older vehicles and then there were newer vehicles near the end now perhaps what we're seeing is that modern cars only come in white silver and black. Oh, that, yeah, maybe that was just a little nod that... But someone must have put some thought into choosing the errors of the vehicles, because I definitely noticed that there was an older vehicle vibe. Yes, yes. Which is true, because that's kind of what this film is. It's almost like it's Mm -hmm. set in modern time, but it's definitely hearkening back to what some could call like a better era. You know, some people... Sebastian would, for sure. Yes, definitely. He romanced, you know, an earlier time. And I think him sitting in his car, and now she's in a very modern Prius... It's kind of like dancing, dancing between those two eras. I have a question out to my favorite costume designer about the eras of the clothing, but she has not seen the film yet, so I didn't get an answer back. But I felt like there was a sense of not just in Sebastian's choice of clothing, which, as we mentioned, he's hearkening back to the older times, so he would have an older style of clothing. That makes sense. But even Mia's character and all of her roommates right? When they get dressed to go to the party, it very much seems like from the 50s. Yes, yes. And I have a note. But before we get to her and her roommates, I have a couple things I want to ask you about. Okay, so in this scene... Opening scene, right? Yes, this opening scene, people are stuck in traffic. The sun is looks very high in the sky and bright. Right. It looks very hot. Mm -hmm. People are dancing around and singing. Mm -hmm. They look 
happy Mm -hmm. to be sitting in traffic. Never. As a former and... As a person who spent some time in Los Angeles rush hour traffic. Yes. How do you feel about that? I think it's entirely unrealistic. I think people generally (laughs) hate it. I would say probably every other movie that shows the miserable is probably more accurate. I (laughs) don't recall many smiles. Maybe that's what makes it so astounding because it is against type. It ends on this great note that does, to me, harken back to the big, you know, Hollywood musical. It ends on this super sharp, punctuated beat. And then the title is just like blasted on the screen. And it's just like one of those epic films from yesteryear of Hollywood. The director said at one point, I believe, that musicals are fantasies. So in that vein, right, it makes sense that it's very fanciful, fantastical, that people would be happy and then kick the doors open and begin dancing. Just start dancing. Right. (laughs) It's very much a love letter to L.A. too, because in the scene like you were mentioning, the girls all getting dressed and then they're in these beautiful colors and they're all like the jewel tones, the rich royal blue, the emerald green, the ruby red and, you know, a canary yellow. It's all these beautifully bright colors. And then above them, you see the neon lights of all these famous places like Musso and Frank's and the Brown Derby and Dan Tana's, all these classic Hollywood locations, his love letter to LA. Which I find kind of odd because the film does actually highlight some of the worst things about LA. So it's kind of odd that, you know, it's like the commercial from the governor, California, it's great. I, I I don't see it, but I suppose some do. There are. Yes, definitely. That is where, so the girls get dressed up and they go to this party. And this is the first place that Emma's character, who is... Mia? Uh, Mia. Okay. I was going to say that, but it didn't sound right. Okay. It's where Mia meets Sebastian. Does she meet him at the party or is it after? She she's... actually flips him off in the opening scene, which is delightful. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if that quite counts as a meet cute, but I listed it as the first one. The first one. Is he at the party or is it after the party she's walking down the street and she goes into the jazz club? I believe the second meet cute is he gives her a shoulder charge in the jazz club. Okay. Or the restaurant. So he's not at the party that the girls go to, the Hollywood party. Not the first one, right? Okay. I don't think so. Uh, Yeah. Now that I talk it through, I don't think so either. Right. So they go to the jazz club and she kind of... Ma- oh no, that's the second party I'm talking about in my notes. I have she mocks him while he's playing in the band, but that's the second party. Right. That I'm getting the two parties mixed up. There's so many Hollywood parties, you know. They dance before that second party, though. The scene where they dance at the street lamp at like at uh, I think that's Golden after Hour. the second party, but I don't know. I know. Now okay. I'm- it's now I'm getting that the timeline very confused. I'm sorry to our listening audience. If yes. you're trying to write a report for school or something, <laughs> this is not the podcast that's going to help you. Yeah. So it's just fun how these two kind of, I guess we're highlighting that their lives kind of glance, kind of. There's these They glance. keep intersecting. Yes. They're not completely maybe having a meeting, but they're in the same place. Maybe not quite so Forrest Gump, but kind of. And then... They do meet at this one party. Her car gets towed. They're walking down the street. And there's this gorgeous scene that was, you know, you'd have to be living under a rock not to have seen clips of. And we found out it was shot in about a half an hour because that is the amount of time that you have during sunset that the lighting is just perfect, that the sky is purple, the mountains are blue, and her yellow dress and his white shirt kind of stand out. And it's a very Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers type Oh, yeah, it's dance. great. That's where I made the note that They don't make movies like this anymore, but they should. Yeah. And then once again, kind of this dance between yesteryear and today, the dance number is interrupted by a cell phone ring and the noise from her key fob, which (laughs) I thought that kind of was another one of those snap back into the future. Related to that, there's an excellent show don't tell moment, which is great writing, where they have this dance number because she's looking for a car and he says, oh, I'm up this way too. And at the end of the number and she's going to leave and she says, do you need a ride to your car? And he says, no, I'm just right up there. And as soon as she's out of sight, he turns around and he walks back to the party and he's parked across the street. Yeah. And I thought that showed 
perfectly in that scene. This is what a dude does <laughs> if he thinks the chick is like right worth it. Like I think a lot of gents have maybe stretched the truth a little bit to get a little more time with the lady. Yeah, but to be fair, it's not just the gents. I believe I told a little fib that I hadn't seen a movie that I had seen. Oh, yeah, there is some lying on, on the <laughs> distaff side of the, the tally sheet as well. Yeah, I think more when you're interested in spending time with somebody that you don't mind stretching the truth in order to make it be something that seems casual and sure, let's do that. Especially if the other person is gullible. <laughs> So it goes both ways. This movie kind of plays with time quite a bit. And at about 18 minutes in, we have been watching things from Mia's perspective and it switches and it goes back in time kind of. And then we see the timeline from Sebastian's perspective. One of the struggles I think this film has is that Mia is a likable character and Sebastian really isn't. Is that, though, once again, because Sebastian represents an earlier era, were male leads portrayed in that brooding, you know, I'm thinking of, uh, what's his name, Jimmy Dean? You know, James Dean had kind yeah. of a James smoldering Dean. brood. Yeah, James Dean from, like, Rebel Without a Cause. Like, he wasn't, like, effusively friendly, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, they all had, like, this brooding kind of... Mm. And was Sebastian kind of channeling some of that? Okay, fun idea. Maybe a, a short for you two, but we get Vince Vaughn to do Rebel Without a Cause. I think that would be funny. <laughs> Total different approach. <laughs> There's probably some of that, but I also mean, though, just kind of the characters themselves. There's a point where Mia says, unpaid bills are not romantic. Or maybe that's Rosemary DeWitt as his sister. But Mia does say, how can you be a revolutionary if you're such a traditionalist? So here's this character who I, I think the character makes sense. It's consistent, who is stuck kind of clinging to his ideas of what the past is. But at the expense of everything else, you know, he keeps losing jobs because he doesn't want to bow to the rest of the world. And it's difficult for him with Mia because she admittedly hates jazz and he's obsessed about jazz. And so I think there's a long tradition in Hollywood or in storytelling, actually, of a character who is kind of obsessed about one single topic. So it makes sense as a character. I just think he's, for the audience, not quite likable. He's not that nice a guy. Yeah, but he's Ryan Gosling. And your point is? <laughs> he's so cute. He gets away with it because he's he's got charm. Don't you think that that is a huge part of casting? There have been leading men in Hollywood that get away with a lot because they can turn on that charm. Their characters can get away with a lot, I should say. Yeah, I would say that's true looking at Burt Reynolds, for example. Right. I just don't see that in Ryan Gosling. Sorry, Ryan. I mean, I'm happy to work with you, but I, I just, Come I don't on. see that. You've seen, what is it? What is my, one of my favorite movies? Dr sexy. Crazy Stupid Love? Yes. More in that than in this one, but still, yeah. Sorry, not doing it for okay. me. Okay. Sorry, Ryan. All right. <laughs> so before we talk about the writing in terms of the end of this film, which is a huge topic. Huge. We need to set aside some time for it. Is there anything else in the cinematography and the writing that you want to discuss? Well, I think... You mentioned that it was a love letter to L.A., and I would say maybe more to Hollywood, but in yeah. particular, it brought up one of the things that is maybe not in the plus column, which is when she auditions. So there's a great sight gag where there's all the redheads in the elevator because they're all reading for the same part, and then she's there and people are you know, just not paying attention, and, and all this stuff is going on. So I thought that was funny and kind of insider joke, and then at the party where he's playing the 80s music... <laughs> There's a guy who apparently is actually a Hollywood screenwriter who's in the like light pink jacket with matching shorts. And he's portrayed as a giant douche nozzle, right? That's certainly what he's supposed to do in that role. Right. So I kind of felt like maybe not so much love letter. There's a little love hate going on there. The dance numbers are absolutely fantastic. Right. Mm -hmm. I love musicals, but I love that they staged these large mm -hmm. dance numbers. But then they also had very much in the realm of Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly, the number with them at the light pole. It was just great. So that kind of love affair. Hey, I'm in. I mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. I noticed throughout the film, there was a lot of slow push ins. Mm. I often think of, of a slow push in as kind of becoming more intimate. Right. 
something momentous has happened. We're going to zoom in on the character and get more kind of close to their emotion. And you could probably say that was really true with Mia throughout the film. Mm -hmm. They had some clever lighting that they would do in the middle of a shot. They would drastically change the lighting. I was thinking in particular when she's kind of getting ready, the entire room is lit. And then all of a sudden, just boom, over the course of a second, there's only one heavy spot atop her. She's looking in the mirror. Right. I mean, what a really neat technique and to be able to pull that off. Well, don't you think that lends to the fantasy part? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That it's not practical lighting. It's we want you to look at this and this only. Right. Yeah. And there's this super saturated, highly stylized look. And at one point I thought it said something like presented in cinemascope. And yeah. the question was, was it really? Yeah, I think so. Because that was a film process. Yeah, yeah. So, but maybe they, a digital version of that now. But that was also amazing too. Looking at those colors, like how did they get everything so saturated without messing with skin tones? So I think a lot of that has to be costume design, tip of the cap to that department. Yeah, I want to talk about that a lot in a bit. Yeah. But I also noticed cinematographically, right? It was just a, a really stylized look, but with a lot of saturation. Yeah. And they played a lot with lighting. When they were at a dinner, uh, there's a lot more light there than you would have gotten out of a candle. Right. But then later in the movie, near the end, they use brake lights to the car in front to light the cab of the car that Mia is in. So that was, a, I, I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Not only are you getting the red coloring, but you're doing it kind of with practicals right. in a really unique way. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of <laughs> haze in his apartment. You know, the fog machine got a workout right. in any of his apartment scenes, I noticed. Was that also, though, kind of like diegetic because it was super funky there because he didn't clean? <laughs> oh, jeez. Let's hope those weren't smell lines coming off of, <laughs> of any of his stuff. Yeah. Um, How many hobo power was his apartment? It, right. So are you ready to talk about the end? Well, let's talk about it. Okay, that. so a little background for friends who know us. Mike does not like non-Hollywood endings. And I should, let's see, let me see if I get this okay, right. Okay, I want to be. I know, I know it. Let me try. Let me okay, try. Okay, let you try. Okay. It's not that he can't handle a happy ending. He needs things to be tied up. Yes. He does not like the Soprano style ending where no. we're almost like mid-sentence of somebody and it's cut to black. He wants everything completed. How, how did I do? That's pretty good. I would say, I believe <clears throat> as a storyteller, it's incumbent upon me to tell you a story. Take a position. I don't have to like how your story goes, but I need you to take a position. And related to that, another way to weasel out is not just to have no ending a la The End of the Sopranos, but there is also the, oh, here's the alternate ending, or we told you this thing, but it's not that. How I Met Your Mother is a classic example of that, that I felt like for seven, nine, however many seasons they had, minus one episode, they set up one thing, and then at the very end, they pulled the rug out and said, oh, we were lying to you the whole time. And you have the right to do that as a storyteller, and they argue that it was an unreliable storyteller. The point is you violated a contract with the audience, in my opinion. If I'm going to tell you a story, you expect me to tell you a story, and that includes beginning, middle, and end, and it has to have an end. Mm -hmm. And I felt tricked too. I went and saw this in the theater and I was unhappy with the ending. I was fine when, so, you know, like we say in this podcast, we're not going to say spoilers because that's just what it is. But here you go. Here's a big glaring. If you have not seen La La Land and you want to enjoy it in its fullness, stop listening now, go watch it and come back. But it's clear that Mia and Sebastian break up and I can be okay with that because yep. I was on board with, okay, they came into one another's lives. They helped one another transform. They pushed them farther along in their goals and now they're going to go find other people. And I was fine with that. But then there's like the last five minutes, it's almost like we're going to throw in your face how beautiful their life would have been had they stayed together. But screeching breaks. And now we're going to show you that no, but they don't end up together. And that is where I felt like such a gut punch. And I was so like, if I had seen Damien Cassell, I probably would have kicked him in the nuts because I was yes. just like, I hold him. How dare you show me what could have been, but then go, no, but that didn't happen. I was angry. Now, 
My intention whenever I get angry at the filmmaker is I take a deep dive on YouTube and I try to find an interview, explain yourself. Basically, if you can explain yourself, I will respect you as a filmmaker and maybe not even like it. But if I know your intentions, I can go like, all right, mate, good job. And I found in IMDb the trivia, deep in the trivia. So if you want to see this, you're going to have to scroll down quite a bit. It says, Chazelle also was taken by the concept that you meet someone in your life who transforms you, that sets you on a path towards being who you dreamed of, who you could be. And yet you must travel that path alone. Chazelle finds that concept beautiful and heartbreaking. And ultimately, that's what he wanted the movie to be about. So I finally got my answer. He, I think, in a way, relishes in the tragedy of meeting someone. There's a potential. They do push you along in your goals, but then sometimes they move on and you move on and I guess continue down your path. And once I got that, then I was like, okay, I still don't love the ending, but I can, like I said, I can respect his storytelling. First of all, his partner should be a little worried. (laughs) <laughs> well, maybe there's a previous partner. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yes, that tells me that he made the movie he wanted to make. And I can respect that as an artist, that he landed it where he wanted to land it. I still don't know that it qualifies, though, as a story that needed to be told. This is my point. There are stories out there that just aren't worth telling or watching. And they can be true and they can have truth in them. But it's such a major production, I think you have to really believe in the story you're telling. And it sounds like he does, which makes me sad, that his experience, his outlook, his worldview, Weltenschaft, what's the German word for that that makes me sound smarter, is that he is ultimately alone and that there is no chance for joy. We all know that the story is curated, whether it's a happy ending or sad ending. We're looking for stuff. The filmmakers, they find something that is compelling, that's dramatic, that is exaggerated, perhaps to a certain extent. And I mean, there was, you know, the like, was it mumblecore movement or whatever, where some people have tried to make films about nothing much happening. But for the most part, that doesn't really land. So I think, again, there's a contract that I see between the storyteller and the audience that say something. And you're right, I guess he did say what he wanted to say. I find that sad. I I, also don't like the structure of the film for telling that sad story, but that's a separate thing. I think that he did tell the story. I think Mia did end up with somebody. She's not alone. She ended up having a husband and a family. And maybe her life wouldn't have been as fulfilled with Sebastian because maybe Sebastian especially with his chase to keep the jazz clubs alive, maybe he wouldn't make a good family man and maybe wouldn't even make a good partner for her in the sense that jazz is kind of his woman, you know? I I don't think maybe count. Don't make the dang film. If it's a maybe pick a side. (laughs) Okay. We will never probably settle this no i won't and i want to say if by some not that we have to some some chance the director does listen to this hi damien i I would in (laughs) fact i I would gladly buy him lunch to have this conversation with him in person i would love to thump his melon to see what he was thinking because i just don't think it works now the structure of the film what i don't like about the structure of how he did that was that last little coda where it goes on in particular the home movie version of them happy together oh yeah it was beautiful to the uh, camera department because it it, it looked perfect. Every department, the costumes, the rigging to have them flying, the the sets. Great great point. I mean, every single department showed up that day. And I mean, I get chills thinking of that scene. That's what I think Mm -hmm. made it such a gut punch because it's such... and And I think that is though what he's talking about. There's this fantasy in Hollywood that is unreal that we all kind of want to hitch our wagons to. And then there's this reality of life that sometimes you don't end up with the person you thought you wanted to be with. Then go make Thousand Acres. Don't make La La Land. That's pretty straightforward to me. So, But you need that dichotomy to show it. Right. In one theater, they're showing the, the musical dance number with great colors and good tunes. Binge and, 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 and Pasek Paul write the music for it. This is pretty awesome. Right. 
Then in another theater, they can show a very depressing movie about a family who all gets like uh, cancer from microwaves or something, <laughs> and they all their hair falls out and so they die, cool. and they're miserable, and they all have <laughs> all to- All movies, Mike, will not go ever, ever go see. Ever, ever go see. So- <laughs> All right. So we probably just need to hit pause on this because we're not going to come to a consensus, but you'll have to give it this. It's given us hours of movie conversation. Right. This is one of the more discussed endings <laughs> yes, in, in this modern household. Yeah, in this household in, in, in modern history. <laughs> yes. Um. Okay, so for editing, there was one particular scene where Sebastian is singing. It's like this be- once again, the sky is just this beautiful color. I'm sure it was the Santa Monica Pier. I'm almost positive it is because I think I remember a reverse shot where you see the rides and the street lights, um, line the pier in this perfect leading line as my husband has taught me and they dissolve into palm trees on a, probably a very famous street that I don't know but cut to her right before her audition and I thought that was you know some great editing in the vertical street lights and then palm trees on the leading line mm-hmm. did you have any other editing? I mean, the whole thing is edited well, but that was one thing that I made didn't note have, of. Didn't have anything in particular. Okay. On editing. So for costuming, we already spoke of the bright primary colors. She had a very crisp white shirt that took a hard coffee splatter. <laughs> The famous scene where they dance at sunset, I read the yellow dress she was wearing is what the stand-in was wearing. And it wasn't the planned dress, but it went so well that they had her wear it. And she has the red dress with a red bag and blue shoes set against this purple sky. It's just gorgeous. Regarding that trivia, my question is, why would the stand-in not be wearing the same dress that she would be wearing or one very similar right that seems like it would be the part of having a stand-in is to have the coloring to match i I agree i agree any uh, we are our go-to costumer is also a a pretty famous stand-in for a couple different portland made shows and she has told us that she wears exactly what the actress wears Mm -hmm. so maybe we need to do a, a costume related bonus app and drag her in here and make her answer our questions just to give you an example of the torture I put this poor woman through is I text her all the time with questions <laughs> about costuming. Just out of nowhere, yeah. unrelated to anything, not compensated in any way, no. just random questions. No. No, we bought her dinner. That's about it. <laughs> yeah, Shout out to Miriam. Um, probably over like a dozen sesame donuts too. Yeah. Oh yeah. She wouldn't turn them down. So another thing I noticed is when he goes midway through the movie, he goes to play with John Legend, which... In no one's mind would they see as a backward slide, but Sebastian definitely does because it's not the type of music that feeds his soul. It's not doing work that feeds, you know, that soul. And I noticed that the costuming got very drab and dark, which was a departure from all of the bright, saturated colors of before and would make, you know, a nod to his mood. There is a good comedy bit there where the like Rolling Stone photographer is trying to have him pose for these photos to make him entirely opposite of who he was. And when he's doing that, if I recall correctly, he has a bright white ball cap on, which you never see him wearing a hat, but you could assume he would wear a fedora, something that Frank Sinatra wore. Yep. The sets, there's, like I mentioned, there's Hollywood iconography all over this movie, especially in her apartment. She's got murals of like that look like old movie posters. The color saturation in her apartment is almost vibrating with electricity. It's (laughs) so bright, but you know, it just, that's what she's working towards. That's what she wants to be is one of those women that are portrayed on her walls. And so I think it makes sense that it surrounds her. She walks past a mural of Hollywood stars. And I have a note that the sets are the sets because they spend some time on a studio lot. Mm-hmm. And so I thought there was this kind of cool meta kind of thing going on that right. they're walking past, you know, gaffers and film equipment as they're in a film. Just like I think all photographers are genetically called toward old barns. I think 
filmmakers love movies about filmmaking. Yeah. <laughs> we call it production porn. Anytime we're watching a movie, if there's a glimpse of the cameraman right. or lighting or any light, like, if I see a C stand, we're hitting pause and we're going back because it's like, we got to look and see what are they using? What bounce boards are they using? Okay. When do we review state and main? It is on the list. Yeah. I think it's later. The, I think it's November. No, no, no. No, I think it's early next year year again a movie about making a movie yes we are going to do a whole month about movies about movies <laughs> okay <laughs> so before we head into our regular sections is there anything else you want to say about this film this is a little bit in set dressing but also just a little bit my own personal question where did they find purple trash cans i know i thought of that too when she came out i was just like I want a purple trash can. And it wasn't totally. like trash can like you'd have in your house. These are like the ones that the trash people come and get. Uh, you and know, they it picks purple. it up and dumps it yeah, in. Yeah, I would love to know. Like, does LA really have purple right. trash cans? Or did some somebody in uh, the art department have to paint them? <laughs> that pulled me out of the movie a little bit because I did think of that too. That's right. funny. And if the answer is somebody in the art department had to paint them, can I get them to show up here? Yeah. Can I have one? Yeah, I, I wonder totally what, would ha- what they would do if we painted ours. I don't think they would notice. <laughs> would they pick it up or they'd be like, oh, that's another company. Oh, that would be horrible if they left the garbage there because it's the wrong yeah, color. Yeah, maybe we should keep it safe. So like a mama bird with a baby bird. You don't mess with it. Right. <laughs> leave it alone. Birds and seals. Leave them alone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I know there is a few smoochies in this movie. Smoochie, smoochie, smoochie. The first almost smoochie is at 5413. It's an almost is that uh, a drive midway? by. And... Midway through the film? About, yeah. And then at 5840, we have the first real smoochy, smoochy, smoochy. And they're both between Mia and Sebastian? As far as I recall. I yeah. I didn't notice this. That's all we care about, right? I mean... Well, his sister at the very end gets married, so I'm sure she kisses her husband. And if Ryan Gosling had kissed John Legend, that would have made a better film. You would have enjoyed that. <laughs> How about head trauma? Did Sebastian see any head trauma? Unfortunately, No. I think that character maybe could have used a little sense knocked into him by his sister. (laughs) All right. And the ever most popular driving review. We already spoke of the big scene at the beginning, but was there any other driving that you uh, would like to make note of? So Sebastian drives an 83 Buick Riviera convertible. Decent car, I suppose, for its day. But it shows him as kind of an iconoclast. You maybe say somebody who's holding the past. But I did not see seatbelts involved. Now, it's possible that uh, Ryan Gosling had buckled up and it only had a lap belt. But I would appreciate that. Mia drives a Prius, which is probably accurate for an actress in L.A. in that era. So, no to talk about there. Shall we go to the numbers? Mm, go to the numbers. All right. This movie was a Summit Entertainment film, and it was written and directed by, like I said, Damien Chazelle. It was filmed at the Griffith Observatory in Hermosa Beach, Long Beach, Pasadena, the Chateau Marmont, and like I said, Dantana's, and Will Rogers Memorial Park. Did you ever go to Will Rogers Memorial Park? Not to my knowledge, but I did go to Griffith Observatory. Yes. He took an ex-girlfriend there. Did not. A date. It was a school trip. Oh, I I'm thought you sure. took a date there. No, no. We went to the Norton Simon. Oh, my, that's what I'm thinking of. On my, the, I'm not going to spoil that. That's a piece of trivia. They're going to have to st- keep listening to find out what that. That's was a all juicy about. one, you guys. If I get a good review, or if somebody pays me well, I'll tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> There's even video to go with that story. I'm pretty sure that footage has been lost to perpetuity. I could bring it up in seconds. Okay, on to El La La Land. <laughs> uh, the budget for this film was $30 million. They made $151 million Easily. domestically. Yeah. And hold your pants. Holding my pants. $449 million worldwide. Come on, people. Don't reward bad storytelling. No, that's okay. <laughs> Damien, I'm just taking the piss out of you. It's okay. But it's, it was so beautiful it to was, look at. It was, yeah, it's such a good film. And I believe that this began the resurgence of musicals in Hollywood. I, which yes. I love that. And it was there a Paul? I know that they had already done Dear Evan Hansen on Broadway. Right. But had they done a movie? Paul, no, Paul no, and Pat. Pasek Paul, I don't yeah. think they had yet. I think this was the first. And then followed, of course, by The Greatest Showman. 
Right, right. So we have to, you know, it was our entryway. We needed this one. So right, can right. you give it that? Oh, yeah. I'm telling you, up until that second winter title card, I love you this love film. You love this movie. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it had an eight on IMDb, but as we have said, IMDb is low. So I looked up Rotten Tomatoes. It was 91% fresh with critics, 81% fresh with audiences so i wonder if the audience was lowered by that last (laughs) maybe so 15 minutes they agree with people like oh boy (laughs) you're doing great there buddy and then (sighs) right yeah it's just over two hours at 208 it's pg-13 and it's listed as a comedy drama musical which we that is why it is in this month of musicals Mm -hmm. it Mm -hmm. closes Mm -hmm. out this month of musicals right so i think we have covered it all I will preview. Next month, we are going to do Kevin Smith movies. I will explain in that first episode on August 1st why we picked Kevin Smith movies and why it's so important. So your homework is to go watch Mallrats if you haven't watched it. And then come listen to us talk about it. It was Kevin's second film, I believe. Number two. Yeah. I hope everybody's having a great summer. Get your review in so you can hopefully win a month of your streaming service on us. We'll make that announcement on August 1st, Kevin Smith Day. And don't forget, Dodges never stop and neither do the movies. Thanks for listening to Dodge Movie Podcast with Christy and Mike Dodge of Dodge Media Productions. To find out more about this podcast and what we do, go to dodgemediaproductions.com. Subscribe, share, Leave a comment and tell us what we should watch next. Dodges never stop, and neither do the movies. 